Uh, <laughs> um, this is from Samuel. Man must first have heard the word of salvation with his ears, understood it with his mind, believed it with his heart, and confessed it with his lips before he may be baptized on this, his faith, and embodied into the Church of Christ. So persecution in Switzerland, you base, I mean, he was thrown in jail, and if people um, believed in it or didn't, refused to bear arms in the military, they were basically thrown in jail. They did not recognize the marriage to his wife and made them be separate for many years. Um, but in 1874, persecution ended. And by the time the Swiss immigrants came to Ellington, Rockville, that was not the case. They didn't leave for religious persecution. They left for economic reasons or to avoid the military. So the first congregation of the Evangelical Baptist was in New Bremen, Lewis County, New York. And in that area, there was a prominent Amish Mennonite church. And many of those people switched over to the um, Evangelical Baptist church. I could not find at where the name, the Evangelical Baptist Church, switched to Apostolic Christian Church. I couldn't find that information. But two churches still in New York have both names on their churches. Who came next? Frederick Ludwig. He arrives from Germany. All the other people that I speak of came from Switzerland. Swiss German. So Switzerland, I should go back. Switzerland's as big as Massachusetts. So if you live near Germany, you spoke Swiss German. If you live near Geneva, you spoke French. And if you live near the Italian border, you often spoke Italian. Everybody spoke German and wrote high German. But some of the dialects, like the Swiss German dialect, is only spoken. It was not a written language. Two years later, Nicholas, uh, Frederick's father, Nicholas, comes. And he has a wife and seven children. And he purchased a farm on North Park Street, the Ellington Rockville. Line. Next, William Funder and his family arrived in New York. They were shipwrecked at sea and basically showed up with nothing but the clothes on their back. And they were imme immediately taken in by the Ludwigs. And they were supported until they were able to save enough money to purchase a home of their own. Uh, next to arrive, William Heights. Heinz name, sound familiar, right in the center of town, descendants. <laughs> Alf, Adolf and Gottfried Baylor, John Lance, John Moser, and Alfred Schneider. You remember Alfred Schneider, he was a big name. We have some of his descendants in this room. <laughs> so from John Moser's diary, I love this. In 1892, there was not one person on the ship that I knew in the old country. I arrived here in the city and was welcomed by the few Swiss and the other church folks. So his brother came a year before him, then John. Newcomers were able to stay with host families, some younger, younger single immigrants for years at a time until they were able to support themselves. So this, this little group of evangelical Baptists starts to grow. Um, at first, Mr. Heinz took a wall out of his house so that there was more room for um, people to congregate. Then they built, um, the first church was built in 1891 in Fox Hill. It was constructed by 25 church members and it saw seating 100 at first ish was the first resident. And within a few years, eight years, they outgrew it. They needed a bigger church. So the, the building of a church. This is from the book Marching to Zion, and that's the picture of the church, which was a house in 1983. It was there, but I didn't drive up there to see if it was still there. But I, I it's still there, so it's still there. And it's a home now. Why do I have Stephen Henry, e. Stephen Henry up there? Well, he was a mayor of Rockville, a congressman. He donated the land that became Henry Park, and he in would employ Swiss immigrants only, wouldn't let anybody else work for him. According to John Moser's theory, diary, Henry only wanted Swiss to help. And Mrs. Henry only wanted Swiss girls to work for her. So that says something of the work ethic of these immigrants. 
So now we have a new era in the Swiss community. Before this time, all the immigrants worked in the factories. They were mostly weavers. In 1890 comes John Lance, and he purchases, and I think it's actually, I don't know if they switched his name, that it was Jacob or John, or they entered, they switched him back and forth, but which was not that uncommon at one point. So it could be that it's really Jacob, John. He purchased a farm on Frog Hollow Road for $1,000, and he was the first Swiss farmer in Ellington. Before he purchased the farm, he worked for Mr. Henry for a few years. Three years later, Alfred Schneider purchases a farm on the corner of Middle Butcher and Route 83. That house is still there. Josh Berger lives in it now. The Baylor brothers came, Gottfried and Adolf, and they purchased separate lands where Oak Ridge um, is, or where Baylor Farm is today, not the part where the big new barn is down the road more and around Muddy Brook. Two parcels of land. When you look in the land um, records of the town, it's really interesting because they list, they listed, oh, we bought it with 12 cows, two horses, two double harnesses, <laughs> and for one plow and 10 tents. It's like, woo! Sometimes we'll even say, and the pile of firewood over on the east side of the farm that's three feet high and, you know, it's crazy incredible. But this is what the Lance farm looked like in 1940. It had the tallest silo. This is when John's son Henry owned it. And the building was demolished in around 2020, 20, I have 2021, but it's used as hay fields today. It's not been um, developed. Alfred Schneider, big name in the Swiss immigrant story. So Alfred, so Alfred first came as a young single man to America. He worked out west at, um, in different branches, went back to Switzerland, got married at about 30 years old, and now decides to immigrate. Main reason he immigrated was because he had seven sons, and he did not want them to have to be in the Swiss military. And part of that is a story I mean, there's no way to document that it's true, but it's been passed out from the generation. So <coughs> Alfred's father was Benedict Schneider, not Moser, was Benedict Schneider, and he was a minister in Switzerland. Alfred also was a minister here. But there's a story about a man who followed the faith and was jailed because of it, and they said, fine, you're going to the firing squad. And he went and they shot quakes and they just wanted to see if he would change his mind or not and he didn't and then the story goes on so that kind of influence and that was a story that came to Alfred from his father so he's like my sons aren't going to have any any way part of that so he buys a farm Route 83 and Lower Butcher um, and he only owned it for about four years, and he sells the farm <coughs> to Benedict Moser. Right. The other thing Alfred is known for is in 1899, when they outgrew the church on Fox Hill, he donated the land on Orchard Street to build a new church. Another of his um, incredible things, so Alfred had to come with money, and nobody knows where he got it, but he definitely came to the, to the country with some savings because he instantly bought this beautiful farm, big land. So the other thing he's famous for is the anchor chain link fence. He came with a machine that made the chain link fence, but then he got a patent that changed, changed the way it was interwoven so that it would follow the lay of the land and not be, you know, if the land went down, the fence would be there and there was a hole. He made it so that it followed the lay of the land and he patented that and it was a very successful business for him. Um, but there came a point where they had to decide to galvanize the metal or not. And they decided not to and they sold the patent. First he leased it and then he sold the patent to Anchor Fence. So that fencing that you see today, so when he sold that farm 
farm to Benedict Moser. He purchased a property on West Road. So if you think of Walgreens in Rockville, the very first house next to it, he purchased that farm. His son's kind of farm next to him, um, and he was very um, much the reason for many young Swiss immigrants. He basically would go back and help young people immigrate, immigrate to the Rockville area, mostly so they could have other people to marry and build a community. <laughs> this is Alfred and his wife, Rosina, and that's their house which still stands today. There's a beautiful red barn in the back of it. And this is a picture of the scrap metal behind the fence of the workshop on West Road that stayed there until World War II when it was salvaged for the war effort. There's probably some scraps there today, huh? I don't know, maybe. Okay, so in 1899, because Alfred donated the land, they built a new church on Orchard Street. And this church seats 150. That building is still there. It's a Masonic temple today. Mm -hmm. So 10 years of immigration bring these names. And it's always called kind of Rockville, even though everybody came kind of from Rockville and moved to Ellington. It just kind of the name kind of stuff. These people come to Ellington. And I'm sure you'll recognize many of these names. The only one I don't recognize is Mariana Wurtrich. But the rest, Goddard, Hoffman, Gerber, Cooper Schmidt, Lookabeel, Wurtrich, and Sonner. So by 1902, there are 18 Swiss immigrants had established farms in Ellington. This is not a picture of one of the farms, just a cool picture. <laughs> <laughs> Who were the farmers? Aberley, Baylor, Fleckinger, Gerber, Hoffman, Isch, Cooperschmidt, Lanz, Luganville, Moser, Schneider, Spielman, Zahner. I'm sure everyone who lived in Ellington knows somebody with that last name. <laughs> 1908, an arsonist burns down the church. That's not a picture of the church burning down, <laughs> but it just helps. So, um, there was a man, Clarence Taft. He was 23 years old. He confessed to burning the church down, and he was found not guilty by reason of insanity. They immediately rebuilt the church on the same foundation. This is a graph that shows Ellington's growth and the pink and the Swiss growth of landowners, number of landowners of Swiss, and how Ellington increased. So you can see that the Swiss increased at a much higher rate than the general population. So because it's not all individuals of Swiss heritage living in Ellington are members of the Apostolic Christian Church, it's almost impossible to track numbers um, of individuals in the Swiss community. But in 1990, the census um, said that 700 Tyler County residents listed Swiss as their first ancestry, and 300 of those their only ancestry. ancestry. So here's a few facts so you see kind of how these are facts from the church, because it's kind of the only thing we have, um, and a little bit from the school. So in 1953, they built the third church. This time it seats 600 people on Middle Butcher Road, where the church remains today. In 1961, they added educational facilities, and at one point, I'm not sure if it's 70s or 80s, Ellington was so short of classrooms that the church allowed the town to have classrooms in the church. Anybody know when that was? It was in the 70s. What? I went there, in the 70s. In the 70s. So public school was held in the Sunday school classrooms. In 1970, 20% of the high school students were of Swiss immigrants. That's a pretty high number. They had, in 76, they recorded 421 baptisms since the late 1800s. I missed a huge part 
Then I go back after this. <laughs> 1980, um, the members had grown to 365 with 300 Sunday school students. Um, average Sunday attendance, 665. 1995, they renovated the building, added, now it's up to 700 seats. And approximately 750 baptisms have taken place in the 1800s. So did I, t <laughs> I have to back up. I think I missed a whole point from from way back when. So he did not believe in infant baptism. He believed in a, re a repentance or conversion of adult baptism. But the Swiss Protestant um, state church insisted on infant baptism. And I think I didn't say that in that first slide. So that's the main, one of the main differences. And that is what an Anabaptist religion is, that you are baptized as an adult. When you um, are at the point where you're responsible. <laughs> you know. All right. Are there any questions at this point of anything that I've gone over? Yes. So the Swiss, the Evangelical Baptist Church started by Samuel Froehlich. He started it. Oh, okay. Because he believed that it was not right to baptize infants, basically, is his name. And that he actually, he was so torn. He studied religion. He was a state minister. And then he thought he was this incredible sinner. And then he had, an, it was like, no, it can't be this way. And he himself repented, you know, and, and kind of saved himself. And then he preached this is the way religion should be. Yes. I know some religions have dedications where they dedicate the baby's life to a Christian manner because the parents and the older ones are baptized. So do they have anything like that? I don't know. There are some great books out there. There's one, <coughs> Marching to Zion. And if the library doesn't have it, I will make sure they get a copy of it. Um, philosophies. Uh, I am not the one to know that. Diane, mm -hmm. when I walk through Ellington Cemetery, there is an arch. And underneath that arch, there's a written story between the, the first marriage of the Bissells and the Pinnies. Mm -hmm. Are they not related to the Swiss at all? So that's a totally different Isn't community. Those are very much Pinney, Samuel Pinney, I think was one of the first, but there's quite a couple Samuel Pinneys. I think there's even a living Samuel Pinney now. But they, um, it was one of the first residents of Ellington to settle in Ellington. And the other was Bissell. Yes. And Bissell is, is a big name in Windsor. Rockville. It was, they were originally from Windsor. Yes, well, Ellington was part of Windsor. Oh. So Ellington was part of Windsor for until, I don't know the year it was, Ellington was incorporated in the 1700s. Lars Billman was a Swiss immigrant. No. Or didn't know that. I did not know that. <laughs> she was. She is. You know her well. She is. So, um, a few years back, I did some histories of some of the farms in Ellington. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about them. They're probably the more prominent Swiss farms. So Spielman Farm. So John and Lydia Spielman, that would be Lori's great grandparents. They purchased a farm, a 50 acre farm on West Road. It's where Autumn Chase is now. The house still is at the driveway of Autumn Ch Chase. Um, bought it for $3,000. And this is John Spielman Sr. And John and Lydia with their eight kids. The, so the Spielman farm then across the street where Cohen's sell their chrysanthemums, mm -hmm. that was bought by the son of the first immigrants and their sons, which would be Martin, Lori's father, and Fred, who just passed away this year. They own the farm across the street that the Comans now own. Um, and actually, Martin and Fred, they farmed that their entire lives. And 
That land on Route 83 and back of that was very wet. And they had to drain those fields. And they built the Ellington Canals, which are still back there. And I'm sure they're silted in over the years back there. And Martin is just hysterical telling the story. He's eight years old. And they basically built those canals. They would go down there and pound a stick of dynamite in there, make a cord, hide behind a piece of uh, equipment and boom, blow the thing up. And uh, Martin thought it was the best thing that he ever saw in his life. And at one time, they miscalculated and they actually blew so much dirt over onto Route 83, it shut down the road. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, so if you ever, so some of these farm histories, there's about five of them. You can find them if you're interested on the Ellington Historical website and also on the Farmer's Market website. There's about five. So the Lugenbuehl farm. So Fritz and Elizabeth Lugenbuehl, they load up their steamer trunks and they come with their children, 11 children. One of their children, Ernest, was already here. They actually sent Ernest over by himself at nine or 10 years old to work on the Cooperschmidt farm. Because the Cooperschmitts were, the Cooperschmitt wives were Lugabules, Fritz's sisters. So um, the, uh, Elizabeth was very distraught that she sent her 10-year-old over. She hadn't seen him in a couple years, and that was a main reason why they agreed. So they come over with 10 of their 11 children, because one's already here. Christian is the oldest at 15, and the youngest was six weeks old. Mm -hmm. So they first lived where the Silverhurst Farm is on Penny Street. And then they lived in the Aborn farm on Meadowbrook Road, which is still there. And then Fritz bought a farm on the corner of Route 83 and Main Street, across from Valeros. They took that farmhouse down two or three years ago, maybe. So where Valeros is was their barn, and all that land where Dimatech and going down was their farm. So it was common to have a house on one side of the road and the barn on the other because the roads were just these little paths. Well, Fritz was quite a character. Fritz would kind of disappear for days at a time and nobody knew where Fritz was. And he, he was a spacey kind of man. Um, and these articles um, were found <coughs> in the Hartford Current. And this tells a little bit about Fritz's spaciness. He, Fritz Lugamule of Ellington, was knocked down and injured by an automobile on East Main Street yesterday afternoon dislocating his shoulder. Mr. Lugumule had left his team at the public kitchen rail while he was in one of the stores making purchases. When he came out, he found that his horse had got loose and was starting down the street toward home. He gave chase, not noticing the approach of Superintendent of Streets Frank R. Rao in an automobile. He ran directly in front of the machine, which knocked him down. <laughs> Mr. Rao took him in his car to the office of Dr. Wright B. Bean, and the shoulder bone was put back in place. <laughs> <laughs> so his son, so Christian was the oldest, but Christian for, was sent out west for a while to learn farming. And the next in line, John, actually took over the farm. Fritz, I don't think, was much of a worker. John was also a parent. And I remember John because I worked at the chuck wagon in my teens. And John Lugamil would walk in, take out his handkerchief, and <laughs> like, and the whole place would ah! And he'd sit down and, and he'd order his black coffee and grilled cheese, and he would pay whatever he felt like. If that day was 15 cents, that's all you got. If it was, you know, whatever, and you know ever question, you just took it. <laughs> so another article. A cow wandered into Ellington Swamp and died 100 feet from solid ground. Is located with the aid of state police plane Sunday. The owner, John Lugamil, ended a two-week search. The two-and-a-half-year-old Guernsey Hopper was the object of a state police search for a week since Mr. Lugamil <laughs> thought it might have been stolen. <laughs> Officer John Yaskolga 
assigned to investigate, at first tried to penetrate the swamp on foot. The going, however, proved too difficult, and he requested use of a plane. On Sunday afternoon, State Policeman Albert Powell and Officer Yaskulka flew over the area and located the dead animal, which had made vain efforts to extricate itself from the mud. <laughs> so they found out. But I, I just love these. You can go on. You have to get a subscription to Hartford Current Archives and search things. And the things that they put, in, put right in there, my aunt at five broke her leg sledding. You know, she was one of Christian's children, and it's in the newspaper. <laughs> so it. Okay, why so many Logan Mules? 11 times 11. Fritz comes with 11. Christian, his oldest, has 11. Lots of Logan Mule. Also lots of Schneiders. Christian, so Christian marries Alfred Schneider's daughter. Big connection there. So there's so many, I, I, you can, we could raise hands in the room how many people have Alfred Schneider or Lou Mule blood in them, lots. So this is Christian and Bertha around 1934 with 10 of their little of eleven children. Elizabeth is not born yet. So just to give you an idea how many Lou there are. <laughs> they were all in the area. They would have family reunions every 10 years. And they rented out the Four Town Fairgrounds. So oh, yes. a little idea. <laughs> so Christian's farm, he was a small farmer. Small. He had about a 25 acre farm, and that house is still on Lord Richard Road today, right? Yeah. So then his son Edward ran that farm until 1986. Yes. Yeah. And then in 1986, there was a dairy termination program because there was too much milk in the United States. And the government said, give me a amount of money per 100 pound milk. That's how they measured it, um, which is about 12 gallons. Give me a price per pound based on the amount of milk you produce in a year. And we will pay you that amount to stop dairy farming. And the farmers either had to sell their crop, sell their cows to a foreign country, or slaughter the herd or sell the cows for me. Um, so th that ended the farming of Edward, and it also ended the farmer farming of Ed Gerber, whose original father's farm was down the road for Schneider's, but then he moved that farm to South Windsor. Cooper Schmidt's farm, and this is a Lugamule Cooper Schmidt. So, two Lugamule sisters married two Cooper Schmidt brothers, and that's where um, um, it was, it's the home of David Captain today. And that farm is where Fritz Lugamule sent his son at nine or ten years old to help um, Suzette because they didn't have any children. Um, so Ernest Cooper Schmidt, he was a very well-known farmer. He won lots of awards over the years, and he was a pilot too. And there is a landing strip on Route 83 behind the Cooper Schmidt farm. So that's where David Capture is today. That's with the house, one of the houses of the brothers. So there's two brothers, two Cooper, two Cooper Schmidt brothers farming, married to two Louisville sisters. That's one of the houses that's data captured today, so you get an idea of where it was. So these these and Cooper Schmidt, they were skilled mattress pullers. <laughs> they all, they used to host these hair pulling parties. You bring your own mattress, you tear apart your mattress, you pile the mat of horse hair in the middle of the floor, you pull it, dust it, put it in a new tent. Ticking. It's a great way for friends and families to get together and help each other. And it was, I'm sure, before they had Claritin or any of those, you know, allergy things. Nobody would breathe after that. Oh, you just imagine it. Hoffman Farm. So Hoffman was one of the larger farms in the area. Um, purchased by Fritz and Eliza Hoffman in 1900. 125 acres, big farm. Well, Fritz comes, has seven children, gets a brain tumor and dies. And is 30, leaving 
Elisa to farm with her son, Alfred. The oldest in the family is 13. Oh, the oldest boy is about 13. The girls might have been 14, 15. They send them off to work in the factories. And she farms this land with her 12 or 13 year old son um, and is successful at it. And then her son, she sells the son to the farm and he does great. He had the largest milking herd in Ellington in the 1920s. So when we think of these farms, and dairy farms, we're talking 12 cows, 15 cows. He might have had 60 cows big for the time because we're milking by hand. Right. This is, a, is an aerial of the Hoffman farm in the 1950s, and that's, I guess we would say Elisa, Elisa Hoffman. Moser farm <laughs> ended up probably between Moser and Baylor's biggest farms. Okay, so Benedict and John Moser buy Alfred Schneider's farm. All right, so Route 83, Lower Butcher, up to Orchard Street, okay? So John, Benedict came first, John came a year later, and we actually have, uh, I have copies of his handwritten diary, and these are some excerpts, which I find <laughs> very amusing, the second one. July 4th, 1892, today the weather changed into storm. Everywhere where one went or stood, we had to hang on to something so the wind would not throw us overboard into the ocean. The big ship went up and down with the flood. Sometimes we felt as being up on a hill and then down. The next day, today you could see people vomiting wherever you was. Some were prepared for it. They brought along onions, salt, prunes, candy, brandy, and such things that helped a lot. The food was good and plenty of it. Bread with sweet and salted butter, meat of all kinds, soup, potatoes, rice, macaroni, that's how we spell it, vegetable, coffee, whiskey, wine, and plenty of it. So what I don't get is how he's talking about comedy in the first sentence, how good the food was in the last. Handwriting, I have a photocopy of the diary. Okay. <laughs> so this is what the farm looked like in 1953. The orchard goes up. And that orchard was there until Roger helped me because I lost my notes. Maybe the 50s, late 50s. <coughs> late 50s, the orchard was there. This little, was this the milking parlor before you built the down below is the yeah. old farm. We have about 12 or 13 cows. Right? Yeah. No one part. Up above is the hay. The wind coming out on the right hand side was room to hang tobacco. Mm -hmm. There was an ice house in the front, mm -hmm. right on the edge, four feet away from Route 83. There was an ice house. Then there was a place for the chicken coop. On the, on the north side, on the left side there, you see. Couple bar doors out of the shop. Yeah. And there was a potato warehouse underneath. It was a very unique setup that was built in the early 1800s. Here. And there was one little silo in the corner on the left side. It had a little bit of everything there. But this barn is still there, correct? Still there. That's the red barn yeah. that they that they yeah, over. So this barn with the four looks like it's four. Yeah, it's yeah. all red. It's all red now. That that barn is still there. So, yeah. Orchard's gone. Therefore, the name I'm sure Orchard Street came. Probably the Orchard was yeah, there. Really in that door. Right above the red barn yeah. was an apple cellar. Yeah. Okay. Apple food cellar. So over the years, so the the, the brothers. Um, John and who was it? Benedict. I'm losing it. <laughs> right? John and Benedict. So John decides um, not not doesn't want to farm anymore. He builds a house in Rockville on real estate. And Benedict kept the farm. And then Benedict's son Rudolph takes over the farm in the twenties. And by the fifties, Rudolph's sons were managing the farm. But Roger was only a little kid. <laughs> it was 10 or 12. So at first they made the deliveries by horse and buggy until the early 1900s. 
And as motors replaced horses, things started to change. Milking machines were done. Um, I think pasture, the law to pasteurize, that you had to pasteurize milk came around 1947. So for a while, they were not into milk delivery. And then they resumed milk delivery. Um, and um, this is a first delivery truck in 1947. <laughs> Ed Moser next to it. And this is a great ad from the Rockford Reminder when they restarted home delivery. So there was a gap of no home delivery. Um, and it's just a really cool ad. <clears throat> then this building gets built where you saw in the old picture kind of where the exists today. If you do this um, and so over the years, this everybody remembers this
for long periods of time. But because of their um, foresight not to spend money and live like, <laughs> you know, the high life, they persevere. So Oak Ridge Farm today is the largest dairy farm in New England. <laughs> Seth Baylor is fifth generation. He's the CEO. They milk 2,500 head a day, 24 hours a day. They began the modern milkman in 2018. New digester is ready to open any time. The digester is um, basically this big, it's round with a big top. Manure goes in, organisms go in, they digest the manure, and they produce methane gas. A truck comes along, takes the methane gas, and puts it into the natural gas pipeline. Pretty cool. Um, they own, right now they own 1,400 acres, but they, and they, they have to rent a lot of land. So they plant 2,500 acres of corn, 800 acres of grass. They have 60 employees. Now, to milk 25 head of cow, you need double, 5,000, because they always have to have a baby. So um, they have those 5,000 cows, and um, they have the new babies calves too, because they're constantly having calves, having babies. Okay, so in the early 40s, this is a map from the beginning of Route 83 by the Alfred Schneider Farm, which is right behind Walgreens, to about the summer's line. There were 40 dairy farms. Okay, Swiss owned 22 of them. Um, so these are mostly very small dairy farms. They did, they farmed their dairy farms and they would grow broadleaf tobacco for a cash crop and also cucumbers because there was a pickle factory in Ellington in the Windermere section. But that's a lot of, uh, a lot of farms. Some of the names that we don't see anymore are Ish which is a very common name and a very common relative to many of the Swiss um, immigrants that we don't see. I think there might be some issues in town. So what happened during the Depression? Okay. Some quotes from people from Bertha Schneider Troub. Members of the Swiss community did not suffer hungry during the Depression. Everyone supported everyone else. No one went without. So when I talked to my mother-in-law, who's 91, she grew up on a farm. She never even kind of remembers there was a Depression. <laughs> because in the countryside, you were fed, not like in the city. Um, the bond, their bond of love and closeness aided them sufficiently through difficult times. There is a story of one family, um, Carl Schneider, the son of Alfred, died early, leaving his wife and 10 children, the youngest being only one years old. And every week, um, Pauline, uh, Carl's wife, would find a dollar in her mailbox from an anonymous donor. And the family survived mostly on potatoes from other Swiss farmers. <laughs> and I, I just had a conversation with Florence Cloder, who was Lance, her maiden name is Lance, and she said, she's, I think she's 97, she might be 98, and she remembers these were her, the children of Carl and Pauline were her friends, and she recalled eating lunch with them and feeling guilty that she was eating their potato soup, but she said it was the best potato soup she <laughs> ever had in her life. That Pauline apparently was quite the cook. So it's so cool to talk to somebody that remembers it. So Christian Louisville, and I'm going to back up before I say this. So the same time the Swiss came, Russian Jews came. The Russian Jews were um, helped by a um, Jewish agricultural society, which this man, De Hurst, gave $10 million basically to save Eastern European Jews. And what they did was hold the mortgages for the farms. So at the same time as the Swiss came, and they kind of came all down Route 83, Russian Jews came, and they kind of went all down King Street. They were not necessarily dairy farmers, they were more chicken farmers, egg farmers, tobacco farmers, very successful, and they tended to help each other. They definitely left because of religious persecution and they were trying to save their lives. Um, the Christian Louisville, father of 11, son of Fritz of 11, 
He was in jeopardy of losing his farm during the Depression when he couldn't make the mortgage payments, and the goodwill of George Pearl saved the farm. His farm was on the corner of Route 83 and Middle Butcher, Pearl, which is like across from Bowles Motor, kind of. He made the interest payments on Christian's mortgage, and as long as you made the interest pay payments, they would not foreclose on you until Christian was able to resume and pay him back. And then, I don't know why this is not show, but um, Christian's son, Ed, also recalls that he was helped by the Pearls um, in the early days of owning the farm. He could count on them for a loan to hold them over until he received his milk check the next week. So they definitely helped each other. So then, trouble upon the farmers. Started in the 60s, decreasing milk prices, increasing land price. Um, prices, developing technology that they couldn't keep up with, difficulty finding laborers, and then they taxed milk in the 1980s, and then 84 was a dairy termination program, and they lost, that's how I said previously, they lost two multi-generational Swiss farmers, Edward and Gerber, who had substantial size farms milking about 350 head. Um, some quotes from Dan Naylor, um, this work, it's not the work that's hard, it's the margin of profitability. So, um, Daryl Lugabiel said, introductions of high-tech machinery and genetic engineering, which were supposed to aid farmers and improve production, did just the opposite for Swiss. Technology increased the demands of production, many Swiss could not keep up. So, the successful ones, the Mosers, innovated, not afraid to change. The Baylors, same kind of thing, survived. So what they do after dairy farming? They transition into small businesses. A free enterprise economy which fostered the precepts of incentive ambition, ingenuity, and hard work proved a real blessing to the members of the church, whose entire heritage was enshrined in the work, work ethic. It's a quote from Margin of Zion. When the breakaway from farming was made, men looked towards white collared positions, but First, they have to go to college, which was not standard practice for the Swiss. And when I back up and talk about the Jews immigrating, so Swiss farming lasted much longer than Jewish farmer because the Jews believed in higher education. They didn't come as farmers either. Many of the Swiss came as farmers. The Jews did not. They were taught farming by the Jewish agricultural cultural organization, but they quickly educated the next generations who went on to many other things. Um, hard work was valued over education. Families didn't encourage that, but they didn't discourage it either. But it was not really encouraged during the time, go to college, go to college. More was encouraged to get a skill, get a trade. I love this film, this, this slide. So this is not meant to be an all-inclusive slide of Swiss businesses in Ellington, but it's a visual of the ones I could remember or I went. So it's pretty impressive, <laughs> very impressive, uh, lots. So not afraid to get a trade, hang up your shingle, and work. And then, <coughs> I went down Route 83, from Summers down towards Rockville, and said, hmm, how many of these bigger businesses are from Swiss immigrants, well, you know, descendants of Swiss immigrants? They start at so-so valley equipment and repair owned by the great great grandsons of Fritz Hoffman. No man's baby <coughs> down there. Great great grandson of Albert Schneider. The cafe, same great great grandson and great granddaughter of Alfred Schneider. Donita, great grandsons of Fred Lugerville and <coughs> Alfred Schneider, double. And what's interesting about Dynatech is it is actually on the land of Fritz Lugbeel's farm, but it didn't go through the generations. It was owned by other people, and then Dynatech bought the land, and it ended up being, you know, great, great, 
the great grandsons of the original farm. This <coughs> is his honor mantle. They got great, great, and, and I love how they have a couple great, great grandsons of the original <coughs> and Alfred Schneider and great grandsons of Gottlieb Zahner, Cloder Farms, great grandson of Alfred Schneider, great grandson of Fred Lumbule, and great, great, great grandson of Mother Cloder. <laughs> Lee's RV and Auto, great, great grandson of Fred <coughs> and great grandson of Gottfried Baylor, but I miss because I realized if you're a Lumbule, you're also a great grandson of Alfred Schneider. <laughs> right? This one here. But the winner is <laughs> Bruce Cloder of Swiss Laundry. Because Bruce, great great grandson of Fred Louis and Alfred Schneider, and great 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 grandson of Mother Cloder. So, Bruce Swiss. <laughs> <laughs> Homestead Pumper, great great grandson of Christian Gerber. Same for Meadow, it's an extra great. Earthlight. Alfred Schneider, <coughs> the barnyard, Alfred Schneider, and Fred the Weevil. So you go down to 83 and it's, yeah, it's pretty cool. Can't forget Ellington Ackway, great grandsons of Suzette Louisville and Alfred Cooperschmidt, and Pure Country Foods. Originally, <coughs> Mozart Dairy was owned by the grandsons of Benedict Mozart. And, and Benedict in the day was not a C, but a K. Okay. Prominent values remain today. Why are these people so successful? Um, the bond of the Swiss community in Ellington has allowed for the continual passing of values ingrained in the Apostolic Church do doctrine through each generation to both members and non-members. The principle learned through these values created the foundation of success for which the Swiss created a respected, versatile, thriving community that continues today. Un they have an unfailing sense of community and brotherhood, trust, honesty, good faith, hard work, love, and giving. And that is the end. Many thanks.